Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews. This is the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of Canada. Now, today we are honored to be sitting down and speaking with Westport Mayor Robin Jones. Now, steeped in heritage, nestled in the heart of the Rideau, the municipality of Westport is a welcoming small village that's big on community. Discover all that Westport has to offer from restaurants and shopping to arts and sports. Be sure to check out local events from the popular free outdoor music Westport Festival to their holiday teas event. Westport embodies the quintessential Canadian village experience. So stay tuned and we'll be right back after a quick break with cross-border interviews featuring Mayor Robin Jones. In the heart of every thriving community lies a well-crafted strategic plan. But crafting such a plan requires expertise, experience, and a deep understanding of local needs. Enter Strategic Steps, your partner in municipal strategic planning. Strategic Steps team of experts have years of experience in municipal administration at Strategic Steps, they just don't develop plans. They co-create homegrown strategies tailored to your unique community. They listen, they collaborate, they empower your community to thrive. Contact Strategic Steps today and take the first step towards a brighter future for your municipality. Call Strategic Steps at 780-416-9255 or visit strategicsteps.ca to get started. Mayor Jones, thank you so much for sitting down with me today and speaking about yourself and speaking about the village of Westport. Before we get into the crux of the interview, I want to get a peek behind the persona of a mayor for a second. I want to ask you, where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Robin? Well, um, thank you for that question. Um, I think I'm going to blame it on my parents. Um, my father died when I was very young, um, but he was a Toronto um, reporter, uh, originally for the the uh, Globe and Mail and the Telegram, which some people who are listening uh, will understand that that was such a terrific newspaper, and we all were very sad when it when it folded back in the '60s, I think. Um, and and a, Part of his job as a reporter was he was literally a beat cop reporter. And so he spent a lot of time with police. Uh, and so uh, when it comes to uh, when he passed, uh, there was a significant um, number of police officers at the funeral. And there were several that my family maintained relationships with afterwards. So the sense of duties probably started um, through that those associations and and I, I think you're aware, not maybe not all of your your listeners, but that continued to um, be important to me. I understood the meetings and the conversations that we'd had that I'd had with these these gentlemen at the time, and so it left me with a strong desire to join uh, policing, and so I, I became a police officer, and so that's that sense of duty, you know, that sense of duty that that we all have as police officers that we think that we are the people who want to stand up for people who don't like bullies want to intervene and feel that we have the the skills and the intelligence and the self-control to do it so fast forward i retired from policing in 2010 as the chief of chief of police for nishnabiaski police in the north um, and that was a different sense of duty because that that was 30 plus fly-in communities that that when I would go to visit the community, there was such a focus on what the police could do to support the community that it just made that sense of duty that much broader. And then I retired and uh, really uh, um, I had also wanted to become a potter and knew that in my police years, I didn't have the time to really dedicate to that muscle memory that you need. So that was what I did when I retired in the village of Westport. I'd moved 14 times up until then and landed here in this gorgeous village in Eastern Ontario and began uh, to take lessons and became a potter. But there was still this knock at the door on a regular basis. Why don't you run for council? And there were um, issues in the community at the time that um, I agreed needed, needed leadership. 
So before we talk about some of those issues, I, I, and we talk about that 2014 election, when you finally do put your name forward, I've got to ask, was politics discussed at the dinner table growing up? Because I'm assuming with a father who worked at the Telegraph and uh, yeah. the Globe and Mabel, it might have been, but it sounds like it wasn't. No, no, no. Uh, you know, and, and funny, um, as but on the flip side, as a police officer, um, you really, particularly when I was a police officer, 77 to 10, you were really apolitical there, because the police act at one point in time forbid you putting election signs on your lawn. So it was um, it was more about leadership than politics. So you retire in 2010 as chief of police and you take a four year absence before you sort of get back into the role of duty to serve. You ultimately. No, oh, no, no. Um, in that period of time between 10, I retired in, in 10. So 11, 12 and 13, I was hired by the International Association of Chiefs of Police <laughs> to, to instruct in leadership across North America. And it was a blast. It was it was a blast to go into, you know, uh, the the some of the southern states. Um, it was a three week course, um, mainly for senior staff, and believe me, it was a blast to go in as a as a retired uh, a chief or police officer from Ontario, and uh, you know, a, a, a woman blonde blue. It was it was a blast. It was three of the best years um, of my life, but it was traveling every week. Okay, so I was going to ask you many different questions, but I think I need to ask this question before we get into this a little bit more. What does leadership mean to Robin Jones? So, you know, leadership's not about being directive. It's not about being bossy. It's about taking the time to assess what's happening around you. So if the assessment deals with staff, it's um, the it's it's important to make sure that you 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 up, when you particularly when you've identified an issue that you really believe that there is five or six sides to every story. You listen to try and and get those sides. And for me, it's to try and help the individuals if it's conflict or it's learning to help them provide the support that they need that they work through the issues on their own or with the person where there's conflict because if you just tell people what to do and walk away it's like taking your fist out of a pail of water you know uh, that th th you can't measure the impact i think being a leader is all about developing people whether it's job related um uh, in their own leadership as managers um or as you know as a coach officer in policing you know, making sure that when I left that person, that they could do the job. I, I want, I just want to make sure that people know that because the next question I'm going to ask is kind of a yeah, hard question. You get elected as a counselor in 2014. You are then, you run for election as mayor of Westport in 2018 and subsequently reelected in 2022. No. No, no. I ran for council in 2013. The mayor passed and there was um, a okay. by-election. No, no, no worries. And so I was, I ran for election in 14. Um, there was uh, one other person running against me. I was acclaimed in 18 and I ran again uh, in 2022 against one other opponent. Okay. I apologize for that. I just election results in rural communities are the hardest to find and stories about municipalities are hard to find. That's why I like no to way. do these interviews and I get to hear it right from the mouth. Um, you are mayor during a very critical time in municipal history. You have COVID-19, you have the inflationary crisis, you have economic downturn that is impacting people across this country. How has Westport fared? For you, as a leader, looking back on the last, I would say, five years, almost six years, since this sort of turbulent time in municipal world has uh, taken stranglehold. So the fourth concern or issue at the time was a very senior population. Mm -hmm. And so that's where our commitment as a community went first. <clears throat> we put a blanket around the village. And uh, we, we managed during that, that first like 18 months of COVID 
nobody got COVID in the village of Westport. And it was, we were supportive, we were helpful, but that, that was number one goal is to, to make sure that people got through it safely. Um, th the challenges are, uh, from an economic point of view, in a small village with a small tax base, uh, but, but the reality is a sewage system costs the same here as it costs somewhere else. A road costs the same, a bridge costs the same. And, and at the same time, the Ontario government had um, Ontario Community Infrastructure Grant. Uh, the acronym is OSIF, but that's what it stands for. And for the longest period of time, there, there was um, both the formula, so small municipalities like mine would get the minimum, but then they assigned, I think it was 10% of the fund, um, and it was, I think it was 200 million. So they assigned 10% of the fund on application based for communities 10,000 or less. So that helped us get um, a more, more grant money. And that was up to probably 90% of the um, capital project um, to a maximum of $2 million. So it was, it was really helpful. We, we got our, some of our big capital things done. That's changed. Now it's all formula. Uh, they put more money in, uh, which is helpful in the bigger picture. If I'm going to talk about Roma, I'll, I can talk about that, that impact, but for the small rural communities like mine, it is hard. It's, um, it is a, and, and interest rates are what they are. So like many places where we can, we're hunkering down, waiting for interest rates to come down or really trying to influence the government that the, the building, ho building homes right across the province is important. We, uh, uh, you know, commend uh, the government for taking this very strong position that we need more homes, but it's not just the homes. It's the pipes in the ground, and it's the road and the sidewalks. And and for for me, in a in a village of seven hundred people, there is a developer who's already built um, in twenty. I, I might be off in in my years, but I think in twenty twenty one he built twenty five homes. Uh, we have approved a subdivision for him. I think it's fifty eight homes, and he is now looking at the next phase. So whereas. Um, there's a responsibility for him to put the pipes in the ground for sure. It's all of the other wear and tear on the municipality. So it, it number one priority during COVID was keep people healthy. And, and we did that. And, and, you know, as crazy as it was with people not on the streets, it was a bit of a community builder because we have seven churches in this community. Two of them have church bells. When the churches were closed, it didn't matter. They still went in every Sunday and rang the bell for, um, you know, to, to provide particularly the people who go to those churches with a, a sense of belonging, that this is their community. So uh, they're hunkering down, uh, trying not to borrow. Uh, people are using, municipalities are using their reserves um, to, you know, particularly to take care of those um, uh, unexpected um, capital projects. But that can't go on forever. And you and I both know that, that reserves will dry out at some time. <sighs> Okay, before I ask this question, I'm going to preface this by saying this is a conversation between uh, the mayor of Westport, the president of Roma, sort of two birds, one stone here, and myself. This is not motion. This is not a motion of council. This is not a direction of council. This is not even a policy of council. This is our conversation and her opinions on this. So I just want to make sure I preface that because I tend to get nasty emails about that. this question. FCM recently released a survey that said uh, it cost the average municipality $107,000 on average to build infrastructure to individual houses or individual homes in each of communities. Small communities like Westport, small communities that you represent at, at Roma, they can't afford to build 100, 200, 300 houses in their community when it costs the average municipality $107,000 to build a house or build infrastructure to said house. How do people, how do municipalities today like Westport, like you, uh, your members of at Roma survive uh, as uncertainty when there's not a lot of money coming in with the formula and they don't want to go do it on the backs of the people who are currently living in their communities. Right. Um, so uh, development charges, Connection the, fees, like there are yeah. things that, uh, ways of, um, of having the developer pay for some, uh, to offset some of that. 
But if the and and not many situations in 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 rural in real rural uh, have um, sewage systems, you know, or or water, water, water on on wells and 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 septic still. Um, but the the piece that, that as a, as the the chair of Roma, um, I'm also an executive member on AMO. I represent the AMO Rural Caucus. And uh, we talk about this, whether it's large urban, a midsize or, or rural, we all have the same challenges with a bridge is a bridge, a road is a road. And in the last couple of months, uh, we at, at AMO have um, launched the um, uh, social and economic prosperity. Have you heard of that? Yeah. Okay. So I just want to make sure I've got that 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 title right as well because they, they aren't words that flow together, but the concepts flow together um, very very well. Social and economic prosperity review, and we're just continue. We will continue to push the government to sit down at the table with like the, the numbers that the F FCM has has provided, um, numbers that Amos provided. Um, Roma just did an intensive study on access to health care in rural Ontario. So those numbers get factored in as well because health care equals opioid crisis, homelessness, and, and other things. And it's still just more money that the municipalities are, are required to spend. So we feel that the way forward is to get an agreement to sit down at the table, look at the data, look at the evidence, and, and find something transformational. Because at, as your, your point, Chris, this can't go on. You know, we, we all pulled together, like we pulled together during COVID. And we pulled together um, in the next few years. But I see the election in 2026 here in Ontario as pivotal for the provincial government to take ownership of those issues that either in other provinces are completely provincial or to, to have an understanding that when they put forward things such as the, the large focus on building new homes, we can't do what they want us to do. Um. I I I, I kind of laughed there uh, under my breath there because you said other provinces who are doing some of these things that I'm going, uh, the 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 councillors and mayors that I've spoken to across Canada would agree that the province has been downloading a lot onto them as well. So Roma, the municipalities in Ontario are not alone in that in that issue. Um, you talk about the mental health and addiction and opioid crisis that uh, more rural communities are facing. Traditionally, over the last I'd say 25 years, you it would be hard pressed to find a news story or a mayor or a reeve or a councillor or a warden talking about opioids, homelessness, and sort of mental health and addictions. But it is becoming sort of second nature for smaller or, or rural communities to be addressing these issues. What does Roma do? And I'm asking you as the president of Roma for this question, what is Roma doing right now to address some of these issues as a collective and not leave individual municipalities out in the lurch and say, you're on your own, you have to do it by yourself because we have other things that we have to worry about, whether it be housing, because... Like you said, these issues are a provincial issue, but more and more municipalities today are finding themselves needing to address these issues because they just don't have the funding or the resources to address them from the province. Uh, well, uh, let's let's talk about homelessness and the opioid crisis and, and what we're doing. You know, and I know that simply saying it's an issue, if, if I'm talking as, as chair of Roma, just yeah. simply saying it's in rural Ontario too, is not gonna get a lot of attention at Queen's Park. So my feeling since becoming chair of Roma is we need to do the research, gather the evidence, gather the data, so that when we make recommendations, it's not, it's not out of thin air, it's based upon solid data. So for this report, this was access to healthcare in uh, rural Ontario. We, we, what we didn't look at was long-term care. We felt there's a, a lot of focus already on long-term term care and each municipality in Ontario has a mandate to have a long-term care home. And uh, since COVID, a lot of focus has been there. So we, we didn't look at long-term care. I'll just answer that question up front in case you want to know why. Um, but we, uh, we spent uh, months um, interviewing, surveying, um, looking at uh, health, uh, Ministry of Health data, uh, public data, to help us build the, the, um, the picture. I think it's my duty to make sure that what goes to Queen's Park from Roma is an accurate um, 
uh, photograph an accurate accounting of what's happening in rural Ontario. Because a number of people I would talk to about doing this healthcare, I'd literally see their eyes roll when I would talk about doing it from rural. Literally see their, and these are some influential people. And I, I made no bones about it, that rural is different. We all have shortage of physicians, shortage of, of primary care, um, access to hospitals. But in rural Ontario, first of all, there's a travel burden that you may not have in urban centers. So if you're if you if you don't have a doctor of primary care in your community, you got to get to it. And to get to it, the doctors in rural Ontario are leaving four times faster than in urban. And most doctors in rural will tell you that they have a, a roster significantly larger than what a new doctor would take on. So let's just look at Westport. If we had um, uh, a doctor here who had a roster of 3000 patients and that person retires, that's also the person that gets us references to um, uh, referrals to specialists. So that person has left. We To take the same number of patients, we with do new doctors take between 800 and 1,000. That's three doctors that we've got to get. And we're competing across the province with urban centers who've got the money to offer significant incentives. So we lose our doctor. Uh, we have still have an issue. So our issue, we either ignore it or we end up going to often the closest ER, the closest emergency department. Where would that Ontario, be for Westport? Perth, Smith Falls. Perth, okay, that's what I thought. Perth, Smith okay. Falls. Um, and so in, in Ontario in 2022 and 2023, there were, in each year, there were over 600 ED closures in rural Ontario. So let's just use, you said, where would I go to? So Perth and Smith Falls have been closed. So if I have to, if I get there, I'm, you know, communication media is not always that good in rural Ontario, maybe not in urban as well, but you might not know the hospital's closed. So you pack your family up, you go to the hospital, it's closed. Then the next closest one is Carlton Place, you know, which is another 35 minute drive. So it's, and they're overburdened because Perth Smith Falls is closed. So it's just, I grew up with a boxer dog and anybody listening is, is going to know exactly where I'm going with this story. Boxer dogs are so funny and so goofy. And one of the goofiest things they do is they chase their little dog tail, trying to catch it. And that's what this feels like. Like we're just going around a circle and we're never catching that tail. So I'm so, sorry, I, I kind of went off on, on no, that. No, what are no, we, so but I, but I want to ask this. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask because um, we're recording this on February, uh, on, sorry, not February, on March 8th. Uh, earlier this week, it was announced that the provincial government is going to be tabling their budget, I believe, on March 25th. And I could be wrong on that exact date here, but I believe it's March 25th that the Ontario government is going to be uh, tabling their budget. What will you be looking for in this budget to address some of these issues? Because I... And this is why this is why I, I do not consider myself a journalist. I consider myself a host, and I consider myself someone not. I just I make opinions, and people just <laughs> listen to me sometimes. I think it's irresponsible for a government to allow the closure of a hospital. Understandable staffing shortages happen. Understandable things like this happen, but if. It is life and death we're playing with in this situation. And this is Chris Brown saying this is not the mayor. This is not the president saying this is Chris Brown. It is life and death. What is Roma looking for from this government in this budget to address this issue, to ensure that people have reliable access to health care in their communities or even within a short driving distance of their community? We need a plan. We need a comprehensive um, interdisciplinary plan be, uh, to uh, ensure that every dollar spent on healthcare is well thought out. Because uh, your your question was, um, uh, what is it that we 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 want? What are you looking for they're, in this, they're in this throwing, budget? They're throwing, they're they're putting money out there. On February the first, the Minister of Health in Ontario announced um, additional funding for. Um, uh, sort of like the family health team concept. Doctors, a solo doctor in, in his own practice spends about 18% of his day doing admin. So we that's, that's the level that our study went to is stop that. 
you know, fig figure out how the doctor can spend his eight hours, his or her eight hours a day doctoring. And so we made recommendations on coming up with a system that they didn't have to do that sort of administration. We've made lots of recommendations about expanding scope. So getting more doctors is a 10 year plan, right? We know that. And as I already said, we're robbing Peter to pay Paul, trying to attract a doctor to your community, hold them to a contract for X number of years before somebody else gets them. But we, we've we offered um, suggestions in relation to that admin time, expanding the scope of, of our paramedics. In the county of Renfrew uh, is an example. So we've got community paramedicine moving across the province. It's a great initiative and I commend the, uh, the government. So they are off the roster for taking calls and they have clients. And uh, so that saves that client from having to go to the hospital to get their blood pressure checked or other things. So there's a, a roster of patients. On top of that, during COVID, um, Chief Mike Nolan is his name. Um, he appeared, if you saw the panel that we did at Roma, um, Mike Nolan was there and Dr. Savage from uh, Thunder Bay Hospital. Um, and Mike explained that what he started in COVID because people didn't have access to uh, primary care and he has continued since is uh, somebody has a uh, need for primary care the paramedic will come and see them. If the paramedic needs to um, speak to a doctor, um, Chief Nolan had docs available by phone every day, every day. So the paramedicine says, I need some help. There's something going on here. The, the uh, course of treatment was decided. If the person needed a referral, that doctor made the referral for them. And I think what Mike said is since COVID, over 100,000 people have been treated. In rural Ontario, there are 525,000 people, 525,000 without access to primary care. So what we're looking for from the government is look at the recommendations we've made for the here and now. There are things that we can do to help primary care be delivered in rural Ontario. These plans would also work in urban, but my hat at this point in time is, is, is rural. The government has formed in uh, across the province They've been called many things over the years, but now the sort of oversight of the delivery of health tax dollars is done by the Ontario health teams. And there are groups of people, I'm not quite sure how many there are across the province. Let's just say there's 20 for sake of argument. There's no rural representation. And yet we spend millions of dollars on healthcare that is the province's responsibility and we have no say. So that's one of the other things we're looking for. If it doesn't come in the budget speech, I too am waiting to go visit with people at the ministry until we hear the, there's no sense going before the budget. But we need, if with the amount we pay, we need a seat at the table to at least inform that decision-making body of the reality in rural Ontario. You cannot get mental health in most small locations. There's pockets here and there where the um, the local um, mental, uh, I'm not quite sure, you know, all the names that they have now, but but drug addiction mental health associations and boards um, where they can allow it. But in my part of, of where I live, which is North Leeds, you have to travel to Brockville, which is an hour drive, yeah. which is travel burden. There's no public transportation. You know, they hour say drive in the wilderness too. <laughs> well, it's beautiful, um, but it, you may not have a car, right? You, you may not have a car, so you got to get a buddy to drive you. Now, there, there, uh, they, there's opportunities to to do it online or or by telephone, and that was great during COVID because you know there was this wall that you couldn't get through. That if if you wanted service, that was the only way you can get it. I'm going to ask but, a political question here right now, President Jones, and I apologize, but I, I feel like I need to because of everything that you've just said. Do you feel like this government is listening to the voices of rural municipalities today? Um, yes. And uh, I wish they would. Um, uh, so so the question is, are they listening? Um, I think so. I've, I've had uh, an opportunity through Roma to meet with ministers, uh, feel that they understand uh, feel that feel that they recognize that from the work that we've done, there are issues that need to be discussed. But it's a, it's it's this is a marathon. It's yeah. not a sprint. And two years ago, we did um, our our research was on 
um, access to affordable housing in rural Ontario. Um, and that now we're starting to see the legislation come through. Um, I'm holding my breath. The new provincial policy statements, which statement, which is a guiding document for the Planning Act. Um, there were many systemic barriers to growth that we identified in rural Ontario that would be covered with amendments to the PPS. And I uh, had an opportunity to talk to the minister in the last couple of weeks. And I talked to him a, a few weeks before that. And I always ask the same question. When is the new PPS coming out? And it's coming out soon. So we'll see. We'll see. I, I mean, I'm getting the feedback that there will be some changes in there that will help um, for uh, that, that issue. We've just given uh, the government on uh, January the 20th or whatever this paper. So I don't expect them to uh, jump across the table, shake my hand and say, this is the best work we've ever seen. <laughs> but I am um, waiting for the budget. And then after the budget, I'll follow through with them. So we talked about one very big macro issue, and that is healthcare. And healthcare is traditionally not the purview or the jurisdictional jur in the jurisdiction of the municipality. Um, how often are you dealing with cross-border jurisdictional issues at a municipal level compared to when you first started in 2014? Because the average resident, I would, and I hate to assume because you know what that means, but I'm gonna, I hate to paint a broad stroke as well, but the average resident doesn't care that healthcare is not a provincial, not a municipal issue. It's a provincial issue. They don't care that education is a provincial issue. You are the closest to the people. Your members are the closest to the people. And when they talk to you, the residents from Westport or to your members across the member membership of Roma, how often are you talking about other uh, jurisdictional issues compared to the true responsibility of what the municipality has to do and what's in what's in their jurisdictional purview regularly regularly like, and it's more often than not well we didn't talk about homelessness and the impact of of homelessness five if your if your timeline was five years ago yeah um you know we when in the winter so people, let's talk about homelessness for a minute, because that's never been something that municipal um, taxpayers have contributed, have have been required to contribute to, um, particularly in rural Ontario. Um, but it's it's just it's just a, a matter of fact now. And we're the, one of the churches in my community is on a a um, sock sock. The raisings they're trying to get a hundred pairs of socks within a few weeks. Um, because we know particularly homeless people, you know, they need, they need dry, clean socks. So it's a really good initiative. And I was speaking about it uh, at a meeting a couple of weeks ago and, and somebody in the audience says, well, do we have homelessness in, uh, in the area? And, and I said, I can answer that, but I'm going to let other people in the room answer it for you. And it was, it was shocking how many Every, it was actually a choir that I sing in that the person asked the question. So it was other, other choir people talking about their own observations of homelessness. It, it, it comes into the municipalities and in, in the urban areas of the municipalities, but it's more in the bush. You know, people live rough and you, you can see it in the winter because areas off county or, or township roads where there's no reason to see footprints. It's not like there's a beautiful bluff that people are going. You, know, you can see the, the, the paths worn into there um, by people who are seeking some sort of shelter. So uh, when it comes into the municipalities, um, it is so closely aligned with the lack of housing and the lack of he mental health wraparound support. So it's, it's a big issue, even at uh, the upper level. So uh, in Ontario, uh, we have... Uh, M many municipalities in particularly in, in, in the more rural area have an upper tier and a lower tier. And, uh, and, and it's sort of like section 91 and 92 of the, of the charter, you know, we take care of our stuff and, and the counties are responsible for others. And one of the things the counties is responsible for is um, uh, the, the social needs, which is <clears throat> transitional or, or um, social housing as well as social services. And, there's no easy fix. You just, everybody needs to work together um, to understand that these people need help. These people matter. And, and, you know, sometimes the mindset is, oh, what are we going to do? And there's many champions like me say, these people matter. 
So put that hat on and let's work on what are the solutions. And then of course, what are the solutions cost? We often talk about what the responsibility and what the uh, what how municipalities, the province, and the federal government can help, or even the upper layer, the counties, the uh, the regions can help with these issues. But there's often one place that we often forget: it's the actual people as well in these communities. It's the residents who who make up these communities, who make up these vibrant communities. Do you see a willingness from? people from the average resident i say I hate to say average but i'm gonna say it, the average resident who says i want to roll up my sleeves i want to find a solution to help people who are struggling right now whether it be through mental health whether it be through addiction whether it be through homelessness because give me give me a silver lining that we're not a broken society that we don't want to help each other yeah. out like we used to so um i think that's a great question and it should be the question um uh, above the fold on every newspaper in the country once a month mm -hmm. because they they looked we we looked at the provincial government you know uh, what what are you doing the community looks to us what are we doing uh and it's and it and when what i in answer your question when there's an absence of leadership that's when i think it becomes a divisive issue that's right well, if sir, um I, I was in a, a city not so long ago uh, I, I was there probably 20 years ago, and it was one of the most beautiful cities in, in Ontario. And I was there earlier this year, and the homelessness issues were, I mean, I'm a retired police officer, nothing scares me. But when I was going out for dinner, I was careful where I was walking, um, because I, I didn't want to aggravate anybody, right? I didn't want to get into somebody's space innocently. Um, so... So I, I think that that's when the business people say, what are you doing? You know, I wake up in the morning and I've got refuse here. I've got people sleeping here. Um, what are you doing to help? So, I, I, but I'm optimistic. I'm optimistic that it's reached, in a way, it, if it's reached the level of crisis that you think it is and I think it is, we're going to find some solutions. We're going to roll up our sleeves Again, it's not something that we can solve overnight, but I know a lot of my colleagues speak like I do, that we need to find, we need to work together to find solutions. And we put the pressure on the Ontario government to fund things like um, transitional housing, where they get uh, safety, security, um, and access to medical treatment. Uh, also, if they have a permanent residence, they get that portion on their uh, monthly monthly check. The Roma board uh, went to, so we generally meet in Toronto because all trains and planes go to Toronto. We're from across the province and, and need to get to the meeting. Um, we went to the city of Waterloo uh, earlier this year, uh, May or June, because that was one of the first cabin encampments that was up and running. And they have um, 50. Uh, it was a suggestion by somebody from uh, on my board, it was the member from Red Lake, uh, which is way up in Northern Ontario, that, yep. that she wanted to actually see this with her own eyes because they have homelessness, right? They've got those same issues uh, as we do across the province. Uh, so uh, the, the mayor is uh, Mayor McCabe. The um, regional um, uh, chairman is uh, Karen Redman. And they made all of the information available to us. We had a great briefing and then we went out and saw it. There's a real solution. I don't know if it's permanent, but what I do know, it, it, having lived in Waterloo for long, and actually that was the first police force that I was a part of, having um, been there, there's 50 people. They arranged for one of the, the um, residents to open up her cabin for us. So uh, there was, I, I, I probably our group was about 12, 14 people. And uh, so they they told us that this this woman was was because uh, we wanted to see in one of them, and when we got there, she she said no 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 no, uh, and I thought oh oh this is gonna go south, and she said I just not ready yet. Okay, so we just stood around and shot the breeze for a little bit. Uh, she wanted to make it tidy, clean, put everything in order. Um, so when she opened up the door for us, um, she was actually kind of sitting in a little chair by the door, and they're small, but it's got a room. I'm sorry, it's got a, a bed, a dresser. Um, she can lock the door so she doesn't have to worry about her personal belongings going missing if she's living, as, as would happen if she's living rough. Um, 
anyway, so I, I she was right right beside me, and and it was there was two or three women standing there, and and I uh, said, oh my, you know, thank you for letting us do this. And she had the most gorgeous hair, it was long, it was a chestnut color. So I complimented her on her hair, and and so, which kind of opened her up a little bit, and she said, I can't unprompted unprompted. She said, I can't tell you what this means to me. I'm getting straight. I've got job interviews. This was the break that I needed. So she won't be there forever, right? She, this, I know, I know this period of time for her to, you know, in the old language, get her act together with proper supports. And then she'll be able to, you know, kind of return to uh, more of a mainstream life. I, I mean, I love that story. So those are things that we can do now. And having seen it, all on my board, they went back to their zones and they're saying to their upper tiers, to their communities, to municipalities, you need to look at this because it 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 works. It doesn't work for everybody, but here's this one gal who that's her story. It's uh, it's surprising how a little generosity and treating people humanly can go a yeah. long way in society in 2024, but that's yeah. here nor there. Now I'm cautious of time but there, here. But there's a go. there's a fair bit of of cost to that yeah right and that community was prepared to make the commitment because they've got five staff on 24 7 you know so so that's why i said we when we look at these things you got to make up your mind these people matter <laughs> and once you're in the mindset that that, that that they matter um then you find the solutions and then you need also to have the commitment for the and i and i praise Karen Redmond and uh, and the mayor because uh, they uh, they've done a great job there. Um, so you <clears throat> no worries. Before I uh, turn to my last segment, I have one last question because we we've talked a lot about the issues, and I always feel obligated to ask this question: What does rural Ontario municipalities get right? What is the thing that when you go to your urban colleagues, your colleagues across Canada, and you talk about what the rural Ontario municipalities are doing right in 2024, what is that thing that you as president boast about? The sense of, so the, the, the predeterminants of health are many, as, as you know. One of them is a sense of belonging. So if, if, if I could talk about some of the economic development um, things that are going on. I, I spoke at, at OMAFRA summit last, uh, so a um, Ontario Municipality of Rural Affairs summit last week. And I took everybody on a tour around the province of these incredibly creative things that COVID, post-COVID, small rural communities have done. Um, one, pers one place up in, um, outside of, uh, in Dryden, he ha they have uh, done an indoor vertical vegetable garden and they provide vegetables year round in the north, homegrown. Um, in uh, down the road in uh, Kekabeka Falls. So your people, when they, uh, if they ever travel, in, if they're out west and they're traveling into Ontario, just before you get to Thunder Bay is um, two little towns, Roslyn, which is where this factory is, right beside Kekabeka Falls. Stop, take a moment. It is so breathtaking. Um, the, the municipality has done great things, making it into a little bit more comfortable of a tourist stop, but oh my God, it's just breathtaking. That's what we do well. But let me tell you, in, in, uh, in, in, in uh, Roslyn, they have built, they have got a factory that builds prefab homes for the North. So when I was the chief of Nishnabiaski police, we got our police stations built in Beamsville. Now you are an ex-Ontario person. Beamsville is down by St. Catharines. And we had to flatbed them up through Gimli in Manitoba, for anybody listening, up through Gimli and over to the James Bay uh, in, was crazy. This, this company is manufacturing, not police buildings, but housing um, uh, there in, in uh, just outside Thunder Bay, um, understanding the North and Muskeg and things like that. So it's terrific. So those there, there's so many things that have happened in rural Ontario because we roll up our sleeves. We know that that's the way that we're going to get things done by 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 working together. But it's it's more than that. It is this sense of belonging. Many rural communities do not have garages with an in attached to the home with an indoor like with an internal door from the garage into the house. 
why would you want to use that? You want to go out and say hello to your neighbor. You want to check on your neighbor. In my community, when we have people who are, are ill, particularly people living uh, uh, alone or where their partner's not, not a really strong caretaker and um, they're having cancer treatments, we just sign up people on the list. And for you know, uh, 14, 21 or 28 days, we all just take dinner over, leave it on the front porch. You don't have to come and visit with me. We leave it for you because we care. So I think it's that 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 support, that strong sense of community, that belief that there's not much we can't do when we put our mind to it. We're kind, we care, and we and we ask how people are doing, not to be nosy, but because you're our person, you're part of our our village, our hamlet, our community, and we look out for each other. So I. I, there's financial things we can talk about, but why would you move to Westport? Why would you move to Kekabeka Falls? Because you're embraced. So I want to, I want to, I want you to take your Roma hat off here for a second, because I'm going to ask you the Sophie Choice question here for a little bit. Um, before I let you go, I have I want to talk about my favorite subject, and that is tourism. As prior to this recording, I told you that if you come on my show, I will come to your community. So I'm looking forward to being in Westport later on this year, and I want to ask this question to you. In your opinion, what are some of the hidden gems that Westport has to offer tourists from Canada and across the country? And for those who are listening around the world on our show, around the world, who come to Westport, what should, be they, what should they be doing? Well, if you enjoy the outdoors, there are trails everywhere. Um, because we're um, audio and not video, people can't see my oh, background. Which We're is video as well. <laughs> oh, good. Well, they're yeah. looking at the village of Westport. And so Westport is um, on the Rideau River, the Rideau Canal built during the War of 1812 and all that stuff. Um, we are the west port of that. So the water splits, part goes to Kingston, part goes up to Ottawa. So we've got lakes in abundance, um, beautiful water, beautiful wildlife. The fishing is phenomenal. So that's on, on the water, whatever you enjoy. If you just enjoy going into a quiet bay, throwing your anchor out and relaxing for the day, we've got lots of opportunities to do that. Um, we are on uh, two trails. So you can walk to Kingston um, on, on one of the trails going south and you can walk uh, closer up to Ottawa going north. They're beautiful trails, um, well used. Uh, so, where do you uh, go? Wildlife. Where do you Pardon? go after after a stressful day of meetings of village of Westport um, council meetings after meetings with Roma boards after meeting with politicians in uh, Queens Park? Where do you come back to Westport to just decompress and just let it all go and know that tomorrow I'm going to have to do this all over again and make my community and the rural Minnesota, rural Ontario municipalities better than we left them the day before? The water. So um, what people can see here are, are the uh, lakes, um, but what's not shown on this photo is, is where our beach is. And uh, it's, it's, it's busy in the hot months in the, in, uh, in the summer, not so busy the rest of the time. And there's a little pavilion there where you can just sit and watch the birds and, and unwind. And if somebody comes along, it's a local and you know them. So, you, you know, you get caught up and have a visit. Or my um, pottery studio. Or your pottery studio. Um, yeah. I have one last question before Thank I let you, you go. go. And it's a very important question to me. And it's a very important question that I think every municipal leader knows how to answer, but I'd like to hear it on the record. What makes Westport such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? So I was kind of pinching myself because I meant to add that when you asked your last question. So to live... It's walkable and everybody walks and most people have one or two dogs when they're walking. So it is a social, it, 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 in the winter, you all hurry and, and take care of your walks with your dogs. But from this time of year on until Christmas, uh, you're, you are walking and, and visiting and getting caught up. So there's that, again, that's that sense of place that this is where you belong. Um, so it's, it's walkable. The service, we have every service in this village. So that includes so great restaurants, great bars, a brewery, a winery. 
um, as well as um, one of the best, cleanest, most modern and, and green efficient uh, grocery stores. They've won all grocery stores, sorry. Um, Kadrinkos has won all sorts of awards for um, his, his thoughtfulness during renovations. Uh, we've got, as I said, we've got restaurants and bars. Our brewery opened uh, maybe six years ago, six years ago, this Oktoberfest. And uh, it's just, it's, it's on the water. It's, um, it's, it's a happening place. Uh, great owners, entrepreneurs. Um, our winery started in uh, maybe two years before that. And it's certainly a place where people come to Westport. They drive from Ottawa or wherever. Motorcycles galore in the summer because it's a day trip. You come, you go to the winery, you go to the brewery. Um, so that's from from a, a services uh, and and the we have no box stores, we have no box stores. Well, we have a Circle K if that counts, but beyond that, they're all independent entrepreneurs, self proprietors who've got um, put their life on the line to open the, the stores. So we've got uh, great women's shops, um, but we've got um, a pharmacist, a dentist, um, a, a doctor. Um, who am I missing out there? We've got one of the, the best um, um, chiropractors in Eastern Ontario. And I'll tell you why I say that, um, because when you go to that chiropractor, his name's Sean Rogers, Dr. Rogers, um, nobody wants to leave. <laughs> like they don't want to leave, they want to stay and, and just chit chat because it's just such a, a relaxing um, professional place. So we've got uh, seven churches, so it doesn't matter what your your faith is, um, we can we can accommodate it. Um, so we attract obviously from the township. Uh, our, we've got both a a separate school board and a public school board. Public schools in in, in the village. So it's got it, so that's why people come here. And even if they live outside, they uh, in the township they will say you know if I see somebody new on the street I'll say oh hi my name's Robin um, where do you live and they'll say Westport and I'll go. Mm -hmm maybe not. And they say, well, I live out on such and such, but I spend all my time here. So I, I hope I haven't forgotten anything. Uh, we've got Alliance Club, so service clubs, arts council is very active. We've got a group of people, Westport Blooms, they do all our flowers. It's just a volunteer organization and it's just draw, jaw, jaw dropping gorgeous. So I, I think that we're a, I, we're a people centered community. I'm really looking for it. You've painted a very uh, bright uh, picture in my head of what this looks like now that I, even while I'm looking at this uh, beautiful photo behind you on the video. Um, Robin, Mayor Jones, I want to thank you. I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for taking time out of your busy schedule. I feel like we've just barely scratched the surface on what's going on. I feel like we could do another like, three hours of just these conversations alone, but I truly want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for sitting down and taking time out of your busy schedule to do this. Much appreciated. Well, thank you for thinking about Westport and, uh, and the rural um, challenges that we have in Ontario. Um, it was nice to visit with you as well. So thank you very much. Now, if today's episode sparked your interest, hit that subscribe button now. Stay in the loop with all our diverse content covering everything from municipal affairs to our in-depth cross-border interviews and our eye-opening exploration of local governance in the political trenches, local government at work. Now, we are your go-to platform for comprehensive municipal coverage, committed to keeping you well-informed as well as engaged. Now, your support is the backbone of our growth and the maintenance of this top-notch content you have come to enjoy. If you can, consider backing the show today. Every contribution, big or small, amplifies the depth and the breadth of our programming. Find the support page link on the Cross Border Interviews website now. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.